Hello, good morning. This is Rick Pina, and I'm bringing you today's word for May 24th, 2024. So it's 524, 2024. Man, I'm excited about this message. It's a Friday morning. On Friday mornings, I love closing out the week strong, heading into the weekend strong. For those of you that have been watching, you know that we're studying the life of Joseph, and I hope that you've been enjoying it. And so all year we've been learning about how to live our lives with a laser focus on God's fixed purpose. And then we're seeing all of that played out in the life of Joseph. Well, we got to a point in the story today where the brothers are going to refer to Joseph as a Lord. And I'm going to tell you what that means. And I'm going to tell you how that applies to you and how he was a ruler in this world, but he was also hearing from heaven. And so there's many roles that you can fulfill and you can walk in when you're walking with God. And two of those roles I'm going to talk about today are kings and priests. So you are called to be both a king and a priest in this world. The title of today's message is The Revelation of Kings and Priests. Don't tune me out if you don't understand. Listen, I got you. Let me explain this thing. It's going to be good. Kings and priests, let's get ready for the word. Open up your heart to receive. All right, so let's get into it. Kings and priests. Now, before we get into it, obviously we need to cover some scriptures here. So let's cover uh, the foundational scripture that we've been looking at all year. It is Proverbs chapter four and verse 25. The Bible says, set your gaze on the path before you with fixed purpose, looking straight ahead, ignore life's distractions. Say that. Say, I'm focused and I will ignore life's distractions. James chapter one, verses two through four says, my fellow believers, when it seems as though you are facing nothing but difficulties, you should see it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy that you can. For you know that when your faith is tested, it actually stirs up inside of you the power to endure all things. And then when this power grows inside of you, watch this, it releases something. This endurance, it releases something. It, it grows stronger and stronger until it releases perfection or maturity into every part of your being until there's nothing missing and nothing lacking. Say that. Say there's nothing missing and nothing lacking for me. I'm grown. I'm growing in Christ. I'm maturing in him. Why? By the grace of God and my experiences. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1 says, guess what? There's a right time for everything and everything on earth is going to happen at just the right time. And now I'm going to cover Genesis 42 verses 24 to 34. But instead of just reading you those verses, I'm going to set the stage and tell you the story. So when we left off with the story of Joseph, he was keeping Simeon back, right? He pointed to Simeon. Remember, he was wiping his tears away. So he keeps Simeon back and he sends the other nine brothers home uh, with sacks of grain. Now they came, they brought money to buy food. So he wants to send them home with food. And as an act of grace, he chose not to take their money. So he takes the money that they, that they brought to buy the food. He says, well, here's the food. And when they were not looking, he took their money and put it in one of the sacks. So he also then told his men through an interpreter, right? So that they wouldn't know that he was a Hebrew. He told his men to give these Hebrews some food for the road. And so he wanted them to have some food for the road. He gave them their money back. Joseph was being very kind to people that were not very kind to him, right? That's the grace of God. Say the grace of God. Oh my God, <laughs> that's the grace of God. So the brothers loaded up nine of them and they took off. And as they left, they stopped for the night. And during their pause, then, you know how, I don't know why, but one of them was like, let me just look through the bags. And as they're looking through the bags, they realized that their money was still there. They was like, whoa. Now, at that point, they were like confused and afraid because they was like, man, I, I hope this guy doesn't think we're trying to steal. Like, you know, how did our money, I mean, did you put the money in? No, did you put the, how did the money get, like, and, and, and they, they were asking each other, what is God doing to us? Like, I mean, like, 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 <laughs> like, man, what's going on? Like, this is, this is weird, man. This whole situation is weird, right? So what is God doing to us? They didn't know that God was actually showing them favor and showing them kindness 
through Joseph. Joseph was in the position of authority. He could have had them destroyed, but he was being kind to them. When you're in a position of authority, God expects you to operate with love and compassion and empathy and kindness. Joseph had the power to do whatever he wanted to do, so he gave them their money back. Now, when they got to Canaan, they told their father, like, you know, what happened. And they're telling their father this crazy story. And then this is what it says in verse 30. They said to their father, the man who is the Lord of the land spoke roughly to us. And he thought that we were spies in his country. Now, I need to focus on this morning. I just I'm led to focus on that one statement. The man who is the Lord of the land They were talking about Joseph. And they were saying that Joseph was the Lord of the land. That's verse 30. In verse 33, Joseph is referred to as the Lord of the country. So Joseph is the, the Lord of the land, referred to that, and the Lord of the country. Now, I'm going to take my time on this message. Now, let me just say this. When I'm teaching today about kings and priests, I've taught, this could be a whole series. It, uh, I preach messages, sermons about it. This is not something I can really just cover in 20 minutes, but I'm going to give you something that, you know, I believe will be a blessing to you. So the word Lord is something that most believers today just, refer, you know, reserve for God himself. But in biblical times, that was a more common word. Uh, the word Lord, I mean, obviously he's referred to in verse 30 as the Lord of the land and in verse 33 as the Lord of the country. The word Lord, the Hebrew word Lord in verses 30 and 33 are not the same word Lord that is used in the Bible to refer to God, right? So this word Lord, the Hebrew word Adon, it just means one who possesses absolute control. The Noah Webster's Dictionary from 1828, and if you know me, I like to use the Noah Webster's Dictionary from 1828 because it seems like the modern dictionary has been messed up. But but the word Lord in 1828, Noah Webster's Dictionary was def defined as this, a master, a person possessing supreme authority and supreme power, a ruler, a governor, right? So that word was more common back then, the word Lord. So Joseph was referred to as a Lord. Now, the position that he operated in with this position of authority is actually something that we're called to operate in, right? It is the will of God. Now, he's the king of the kings. He's the Lord of the lords, but it is the will of God. If God is going to be the king of the kings, then that means that we can be kings. If he's the Lord of the lords, that means that we can be lords. I will explain that today. Many Christians today, for whatever reason, they believe that it's almost like their, their hope is on on delayed time, right? Like, like they, they believe that they're going to be great one day, one glad morning when this world is over, I'll fly away. Like they're waiting for the sweet by and by in heaven. And so they don't see themselves prospering, winning, experiencing God's best now down here in this world. They don't see themselves operating in authority down here in this world on the earth. It's almost like their hope is deferred right? It's almost like their expectation is on time delay because they're like, oh, I'm just going to suffer while I'm here in this world. But that's okay, baby. Why? Because I'm a pilgrim just passing through. Ooh, glory, baby. My, my, my hope is in heaven. My home is in heaven. I'm sending up timber because my home is in heaven. Listen, that's not the will of God. Let, let me be clear about something. That is not the will of God. God, God didn't send us to this world to suffer and then wait till someday we're going to get to heaven and then be blessed because that would mean that God has two wills. God doesn't, it would mean like God has a will for us in heaven and a will for us in the earth. No, God told us to pray. What you see in heaven, pray that for the earth. Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? On earth. How? As it is in heaven. Oh, no, no. Whatever I see in heaven, that's what I'm supposed to pray down here in the earth. So what does this mean for you today? That was a lot of setup. <laughs> I have three things for you this morning. Y'all ready? Number one, here we go. Understanding our dual role as kings and priests. Now, let me explain. If you look at the 12 tribes that comprise the nation of Israel, 12 tribes, they were divided into one tribe of priests and 11 tribes of kings. Now, the tribe of priests, these were the ones, the Levites, the Levitical priesthood, these were the ones that spent time in the presence of the Lord. 
they engaged in all the religious duties and practices. They washed themselves. They anointed themselves. They went before God. They entered the sanctuary. The high priest, once a year, entered the most holy place, the holy of holies, where the Holy Spirit lived above the Bema seat, above the Ark of the Covenant, right? These were the people that heard from heaven. And so what they did was they would go in only one tribe of priests, would hear the petitions of 11 tribes of kings and they would come in and they would bring the petitions before the Lord and then they would hear what the Lord says and they would come out of God's presence and come back and communicate what the Lord said and they would say thus saith the Lord and the Lord wants us to do this and the Lord wants us to do that and so now the 11 tribes were then equipped with the revelation from heaven to go out and conduct their activities in this world. They conducted business, say business. They raised livestock. They secured silver and gold. They did battle. And they did so with the advantage of knowing that someone on their team, the Levites, heard from heaven. So now they have divine insight and that divine insight gives them an edge, gives them an advantage. So now they experience victory. And when they experience victory, they come back with the spoils and they take a portion of the spoils. Come on, man. I feel like preaching this morning. They take a portion of the spoils and they gave it over to the Levites to take care of them because they didn't have a job other than hearing from heaven. And so they made sure that the house of God was taken care of with a portion of the spoils and the rest was for them. And then the, then the, the Levitical preacher go, go back and hear from heaven, come back, give them the revelation from heaven, and they would go back into their worldly affairs and they would win again. So you got to understand that these roles, one was spending time with God, one was operating in this world, one was hearing from heaven, one was doing business. One was, And watch this, under the New Testament, we are called to fulfill both roles. If you go to the last book in the Bible, uh, the last book of the Bible, the revelation of Jesus Christ, written by John. John opens up this chapter in chapter one. He says, now may kindness and peace be yours from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Jesus was the first to conquer death and he is our ruler over all of the earthly kings. Once again, they, he's the king of the kings. He's the Lord of the lords. He says, Christ loves us. And by his blood, he set us free from sin. Now watch this. This is what John says. He lets us rule as kings and serve God, his father, as priests. Look at what the Bible says. God lets us rule as kings and serve God, the father, as priests. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Revelation chapter 1 verses 5 and 6 says that we are both kings and priests in this world. So, so. We, we are kings and priests. We get to rule like the kings rule, and we get to operate as priests and hear from heaven. The King James says, Jesus has made us kings and priests unto God. Put in the chat, say, we are kings and priests unto God. This is not an assignment that we're going to get in heaven. No, this is an assignment that we have right now in the earth. So let me explain. Kings and priests, this is a dual role, and you and I are called to fulfill both. This dual role is part of God's purpose in this world as part of his kingdom. We are kings on the earth. Let me explain. We are, what does that mean? It, it means that you are called to rule, to dominate, to govern, to win in all of your earthly initiatives and your earthly endeavors, right? Joseph was a great example of this, and he was referred to as the Lord of the land or the Lord of the country. Why? Because he was operating with godly authority. His position of authority made him the Lord. He was the, the person in charge. He was the person that had the authority. He was the person that had the power. He was the person that had the power to bless others and to carry out God's plans. Say this, put this in the chat. I am that person. Glory to God. So I'm a king. Now, you're also a priest. A priest they heard from heaven. A priest they spent time with God. A priest they got divine insight. And that divine insight was designed to give the people of God an advantage in this world. So this spiritual insight allows us to make decisions that are aligning up with heaven, his plans, and his purposes. The priest in Israel, they sought God for direction, and then they shared that guidance with the 11 tribes of kings, providing them with divine strategies for success. So how does this apply to you? Well, you got to recognize that you have both spiritual 
and natural authority in this world. Say that. Say, I have spiritual and natural authority in this world. So you should embrace your role as a leader. Say, I'm a leader. Embrace your role as a leader and exercise leadership and influence within your sphere, the sphere of influence that God has given you. He wants you to affect uh, with effects and influence the people and the systems of this world. So you got to know that God has empowered you to succeed and you got to go out there and impact this world for God's glory. You want to seek guidance concerning everything that you do. You want to allow the wisdom of God, the Holy Spirit, to lead you in all of your activities and actions. And then you got to understand, watch this, that earthly success reflects the glory of God and advances God's kingdom. God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. That's Psalms 35 and verse 27. So you got to balance your responsibilities as both a king, I'm doing business in this world, and a priest, I'm hearing from heaven on a daily basis so that while I'm doing what I'm doing, while I'm going into every meeting, every conversation, and all the activity that I engage in on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, on an annual basis, I'm doing so with my decisions bathed in prayer, and I'm lined up with the wisdom of God. Watch this. I'm hearing God's voice. The Holy Spirit is speaking to me clearly, and he's leading me to win. Put in the chat, God is leading me to win. God is leading me to overcome. God is leading me to success. God is not going to lead you to fail. You you were not born to fail. You were born to win. Brother Pena, are you preaching the prosperity gospel? I don't know what that means. But, but I know God doesn't want you to fail. I know that much. I, and so, so God wants you to experience his best so you can exercise divine authority in this world. Say amen to that. Number two, leveraging divine insight for earthly success. God's revelation provides us with a distinct advantage in life and in business. Put that in the chat. I have a distinct advantage advantage. Why? Because I hear from heaven. Why? Because I have the Holy Spirit. See, when we operate with divine insight, we can confidently navigate the challenges of this world and also seize every opportunity. Divine insight gives us an advantage. Joseph got divine insight from heaven. As a result, Egypt had an advantage. Egypt knew something that nobody else knew, so they were prepared when nobody else was prepared. That's how it can be with you. See, when you have a connection with God, your position to make decisions and execute actions in this world that are different from the world because you're not living off of the world's strategy. You're getting a strategy that is coming from heaven. Put in the chat, say, my strategy and my insight comes from above. See, revelation from heaven leads to victory in this world. Come on now. Revelation from heaven leads to, leads to victory down here in this world. I gain an advantage over those that, that are not hearing from heaven. David said this. Listen to what David said. This is in Psalms 119 and verse 98. David said, by considering your commands, God, I have an edge over my enemies. For I take seriously everything you say. He says, listen. God, David was both a king and a priest. And he said, listen, he was a prophet, priest, and king. He said, listen, I'm going to spend time with you, God. And since I take seriously everything that you say, then what you say to me gives me an advantage. I have an advantage over the people down here in this world. What is that advantage? I hear from heaven. See, like, you know how people hire consultants down here in this world? Well, guess what? I'm consulting with God. Put in the chat, say, I am consulting with God. Just as leaders are hiring consultants, business consultants, church consultants, you know, ministry consultants, I'm consulting with God. God is my consultant and, and his consultation is free. All it's going to cost me is some time with him. I'm going to spend time with him. I'm going to spend time in the word. I'm going to spend time with the Holy Spirit and I consult with God. Say, I consult with God. How does this apply? to you? Well, you got to spend time in God's presence. You got to seek divine wisdom. You got to spend time in prayer and in the word of God. And then when God speaks to you, you got to believe that what he's leading you to do is going to give you an advantage. Even when it doesn't seem, even when it seems like you're a little bit off and people are like, why are you doing that? Well, I heard from God to do that. So you got to understand that divine insight gives you a competitive advantage. Why? Because you're hearing from heaven when other people are not. And so you are hearing from heaven. You have the revelation to overcome the challenges. You go, you have the revelation to experience anything that you need to experience so that you can advance God's kingdom. And watch this, you are viewing your relationship with God as your most valuable asset. 
in achieving your goals. You, you have goals in your career. You have goals in your business. How do you achieve those goals? I'm going to spend time with God and God is going to lead me concerning what to do and how to do it, what position to take and what position not to take, what, what deal to go after and what deal not to go after, what to submit and what not to submit. Why? Because I'm hearing from heaven. And that gives me an advantage. Glory to God. All right, number three, last point for today so I can let you go. Man, this is some good stuff. Balancing authority and compassion. If you are a godly leader, you have to balance authority and compassion. Operating as kings and priests, right? Kings, authority, priests, I'm hearing from heaven. It helps us to exercise authority, but to do so in a godly way with compassion and with empathy. See, authority, godly authority comes with compassion. Joseph had the power to retaliate, to get revenge against his brothers. But he chose not to. Why? Because he was a godly leader. Why? Because he wasn't led to. He exercised restraint. That showed his maturity. And that shows his confidence in God's plan. Actually, he was being kind to people that were not kind to him. That's how you could do it when you were a godly leader, right? And then you create a, a culture where people can thrive. So in our business, Isabella and I strive to create a culture where our people f know that they're loved and appreciated and supported so that they can thrive. It's not just about the business, it's about the people. And so you want to create an environment, if you're a leader, everyone under your leadership should know that you care, that you genuinely care about them. As a result, it, you, yes, you're the person in charge, you're the person with the authority, you might even have pink slip authority over them, but they know that you lead with compassion and godly character and integrity, and you also do it so with empathy, and right? You are a godly leader. They know you're in charge, but because you're a godly leader and you're doing what the Holy Spirit leads you to do, they feel like they can thrive under your leadership. They're noticing that you don't lead the way that other people lead, that you actually lead with integrity and love and compassion, and you do things the right way, and you're, you're honest, and you're upright, and you're not cutting corners, and you're doing, you're, like, you're doing things the way that lines up with the values that you say that you claim to possess. And so your audio matches your video and people say, I want to work for somebody like that. Say amen to that. So how does this apply to you? Let me wrap this up so I can let you go. Exercise your authority. If you're a leader, exercise your authority. I am a leader. I'm going to exercise my authority, but I'm going to do so with compassion. I'm going to make a conscious decision to operate with compassion. I, people are going to see me forgive others. People are going to see me Watch this. Even when I have the opportunity to retaliate, I don't always have to do that. I, I create an environment that, that, uh, that is full of love and appreciation and support where people can thrive because they know that I'm there to support them. I'm building their up, them up. I'm a, I'm a servant leader. I'm leading with godly character. I'm setting a standard that other people notice. I'm setting a standard of integrity that may be uncommon in this world, right? In, a, in, a, in an environment where people are cutting corners, in an environment where people are doing all kinds of things, I don't compromise my values because whatever you compromise to get, you're going to have to compromise to keep. Put that in the chat. If you compromise to get it, you're going to have to compromise to keep it. Put in the chat, I refuse to compromise. Why? Because I'm a godly leader. I'm a, a king, but I'm also a priest. So I have authority, but I also hear from heaven. I hear from heaven, but I also have authority. I'm doing both. I'm not just spending time in the presence of God. I'm out here doing business. I'm not just doing business. I'm out here spending time in the presence of God. God has made me a king and a priest in this world. Oh my God, that was good. Let's close this message out with a declaration of faith. We're going we're gonna to speak this over our lives and do so by faith. Lift up your voice and say this. Say, I embrace my dual role as a king and a priest on the earth. I rule dominate, govern, and win in my earthly endeavors. I do so by your grace. I do so for your glory. I seek and receive divine insight. And your revelation guides my decisions and my actions. Now, this insight gives me an advantage, and it sets me up for success. I operate with both authority and compassion, reflecting your character, Father, in this world. I choose love and forgiveness. I choose compassion and grace. I'm a conduit of your love in this world. I balance my natural and spiritual assignments. In doing so, I make divine impact and advance your kingdom. My earthly prosperity 
opens the door to evangelism. So I'm free to tell people about your son, Jesus the Christ, my Lord. Living this way, I know greater is coming for me. I declare this by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. This is today's word. So please apply it and prosper. If you're not getting these messages, please go to todaysword.org. If you want my notes, you get my notes for free. Uh, click on the big red subscribe button uh, and uh, put in your email address. You're going to get all my notes in your email inbox every day for free. Listen, I know this message was good. I saw the chat was going crazy. I'm going to go back and read some of the messages in the chat. So I need you to do me a favor. Three things. If this message was a blessing to you, leave me some comments in the chat. Number two, share this message on your social media, on your timeline and with your friends. And number three, watch this outro video and make yourself available to these resources. I'll see you on Tuesday morning. Happy Memorial Day weekend. God bless you. If our ministry is a blessing to you, please consider becoming a partner with Rick and Isabella Pena Ministries. Not only will you support the Word of God going out on a daily basis, but you will also support our school in the Dominican Republic, where we are providing 200 Haitian children a Christ-based education free of charge and also a hot meal every day. If you want to become a partner with us, go to ripministries.org and you'll be able to do so there. If you don't have any of my materials, well, let me just show you a few things. Well, this is my first book, Level Up Your Life, where I cover how to level up your life in five areas of your life. Here's Grace-Based Success. It's a daily devotional where in 28 days, you'll be able to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then here's two affirmations books, one for men and one for women. These books will help you to align your faith, your heart, and your lips with the word of God. Or just go to rickpina.co. You'll see all the books there, apparel. Please make yourself available to those materials. They will be a blessing to you. Lastly, Isabella and I have been committed to coaching and mentorship for many, many years. And the Lord led me to use a platform where I could do it online, where we can leverage ourselves and scale. So now we have over 600 videos and continuing to grow. We're recording videos on a weekly basis where we're covering how to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and how to be successful as a Christian and in business and with relationships and etc. So if you're interested in that, please go to patreon.com forward slash Rick Pina. You will be blessed. Thank you for being a blessing to us and we pray that we will continue to be a blessing to you.